Good morning, everyone. My name is Lucia Mokris, and I'd like to welcome you to the OccuPoint and Society of Decision Professionals joint webinar. Um, I'm the founder of Arrhenii Consulting, and what Arrhenii does is focus on getting to the bottom of project roadblocks, figuring out where things are falling apart with people and the process. I invite you to check out my website. It's arrhenii.consulting.com. I'm a proud member of Occam Point. It's a really excellent consortium of experts covering a wide range of functional areas. We have independent consultants, niche specialists, and boutique service providers. We foster a collaborative environment and we connect companies and fill in the gaps in product development and create opportunities for really meaningful partnerships. The Occam Point webinar is one of the ways that we engage with our audience and with our stakeholders. So it's a great opportunity to learn about what's the latest and greatest in life science and medical device spaces. For speakers, it's a really great opportunity to share information about knowledge or product audience um, that is curated. We thank our sponsors without whom we would not be able to put these webinars on. I also wanted to talk a little bit about the Society for Decision Professionals, who is co-hosting this event with us today. SDP is the World Forum on Decision Making, and it brings together industry and academic experts who are dedicated to the art and science of decision-making. SDP members design and implement decision frameworks that really drive real-world impact across various sectors. And this may include frameworks for product development milestones or making go and no-go decisions, product and portfolio management, risk and NPV modeling, organizational scaling, you name it. A community of practitioners that's committed to learning from each other and advancing the field together. We invite you to join SDP. There is information up here on the slide. I would like to introduce Zoran Antonievich. He is the Chief Scientific Officer of Bioforum. He's a real expert in adaptive tr clinical trial design with deep experience in clinical trials. He's an expert in decision sciences and statistics and has over 30 scientific papers and many more uh, 70 plus presentations. And he's edited two books, Platform Trials in Drug Developments and Optimization of Pharmaceutical R&D Programs and Portfolios. Predictive biomarkers have the potential to increase the benefit to patients and sponsors. Patients can benefit in such a way that if uh, a biomarker is identified and developed, uh, they have an opportunity to receive more optimal treatment in terms of uh, uh, risk and benefit. For sponsors, uh, successful uh, biomarker development can improve probability of success. And if th their trials are successful, it can uh, better differentiate the product uh, on the market. Uh, whatever I present today can be applied to enrichment in general. You can enrich, let's say, by, by disease uh, severity or by gender. But when you have a biomarker involved in enrichment, uh, you're adding cost, you're adding complexity to drug development, and very likely you're adding the time to drug development. Uh, additionally, any biomarker will reduce the, the market size. And uh, as uh, the FDA guidance uh, from 2019 on enrichment is pointing out, uh, uh, that there may be an implication on labeling. Um, let's go into program level solutions. You have to consider cost, you have to consider probability of success of your program, expected revenues, expected re revenues as measured expected NPV or risk-adjusted NPV, and return on investment, unless there are good indications that probability of success is going to be improved, the biomarker is not worth the consideration. Now, development is going to reduce your mar market size, and this is why people bypass development of biomarkers. I'm going to argue that you need to see a more complete picture. Biomarker development can affect time to market, and this can affect the value. Probability of success 
has to be greater than original probability of success. The most straightforward way to judge whether investment in biomarker is beneficial is to analyze that in the con context of one individual program. If in some way you're better off with this incremental expected benefit than what you are spending on, than your incremental cost, the decision should be go. We can call this naive decision making. Let's say we have a product for which we expect expected revenues multiplied by, by probability of success. $500 million and the cost is $100 million. The expected um, revenues minus cost, $400 million. And the return on investment is five. And I said, okay, we create a scenario that is a little bit optimistic, but not unreasonable. So let's say that you're reducing your market by 50% and the profile is such that the value is threefold and we're increasing the probability of success twice and you're adding 20% to your original cost of drug development, then you plug this into this formula and you get just incremental revenues of 1 billion and the incremental cost is 20 million and expected revenues minus expected cost. The difference is now 980 million. And these are calculations to illustrate these formulas that I presented before. So to lead us to the real question, in practice, investment to develop a biomarker will usually complete investments with other programs within the portfolio. It can compete with a whole new program, for example. It may be taking money away from that. So the decision should be made in the portfolio context. The outcome of interest in now is incremental you know, investment because you want to maximize the revenues per a dollar invested. We are having to switch to a different measurement when we switch from program level to the portfolio. I'm going to show an example, and it's probably one of the most complicated designs that you may have, uh, but I will go through all the concepts related to enrichment and specifically enrichment by using biomarkers. So predictive enrichment is in identification of patients in this case, with a specific biomarker that are more likely to respond to a given treatment. So you expect the treatment is going to work better on that subpopulation. The FDA guidance over offers several strategies for this, and one of them is adaptive enrichment design. So what do we need to do for any enrichment design? Always have to pre-specify biomarkers of interest because otherwise it's phishing. Phishing is for exploratory stage of development. You also need to pre-specify them because you have to stratify by the biomarker status. You either compare biomarker positive versus biomarker negative, which may sound more intuitive at the beginning. However, to analyze things financially, you really need to make decisions based on biomarker positive versus the overall population. Is there a value of decision-making at an interim analysis? Yes, then adaptive enrichment design. No, just go with a traditional design and for statisticians on the call in either situation you will have to adjust your alpha by using the closed test testing procedure so this would be a two-stage design adaptive enrichment design you start with, with all comers you have an interim analysis you have enough time to really assess this based on the primary endpoint or should it be some endpoint that's predictive of that end endpoint in oncology do you have enough time to look into the overall survival, or you need to, to make decisions based on, on the PFS. How do you get to an adaptive enrichment design? Let's say at the end of phase two, you know that your whole population, the results are not satisfactory. So then you're taking a look at the biomarker subpopulation, and if the drug doesn't work in that subpopulation, you stop development. If it works for that subpopulation, then you go into phase three and you regulate that in, regulate enrollment criteria. So essentially, you exclude biomarker negative uh, patients from the study. If the whole population results are positive, you can still consider looking into enriched subpopulation only to further improve your chances of success. If there is a signal that biomarker population may be doing better, then you can go with an adaptive enrichment design. There are several <coughs> questions that you need to ask yourself. One is, do you focus on the full population first? And then if that is not working, you go down. And this is the most common scenario. Um, the other one is you're really interested in your biomarker subpopulation. And then you can just proceed to direct comparison of two subpopulations. And third one, you're actually not interested in biomarker subpopulation, but 
there is some indication that it works in biomarker subgroup, and you're keeping this as a way of salvaging the trial, and the approach is the same as here. You know, you look at the full population first. If that's not working, then you go to the subpopulation. You are stratifying by biomarker status, and you have an interim analysis. Con conditional power means that based on the data observed at the interim analysis, what is the probability that we are going to have a significant p-value in the end? If that probability is low, let's say less than 30%, then you just close the study. You move your resources to other trials. If you started, let's say, your original power is 80% and your conditional power is greater than 80%, you just continue study as planned. However, if the data is inconclusive, you can compare conditional power of subpopulation versus the complement of the subpopulation or conditional power for the subpopulation minus conditional power for the full population. I have seen both kinds of criteria. This one is more applicable here. Let's say that twice, if conditional power, if that probability of success is at least 20% greater, you're going to enrich. And you restrict enrollment, you, you just remove one strata, and you probably have to increase the sample size for the biomarker positive subpopulation. And we can talk about statistical means and analysis of this. There are obviously ways to control alpha for all this. If these two conditional powers are fairly similar, then, then you continue as planned. There's so many different ways that you can set up your decision criteria here. By this time, you have analyzed what percentage of market you're going to have with this biomarker, the cost in the incremental cost doing this study, what's the difference in probability. Marketing people can relate this quantity to certain market value. Then, then you have answers to put back into that equation that I was showing. Let's go to the portfolio. With focus on portfolio, there is a focus on maximizing efficiency. Efficiency in this context means maximizing return on investment. So you need to define what is return, what is investment. In clinical development, decisions can be made at trial program, master protocol, or portfolio level, because your trials and your programs are competing for resources. And you will be amazed when you run any simulations how much improvement you can get by optimizing portfolios. This is coming from a paper that was published in the 19th century. So the idea here is that you have an AppSec and to use a simple program level example, one kilogram represents one million of your budget. So you have a budget of a million dollars, but you have items that they cannot all fit. You want to maximize the value of what you put in the AppSec. So two different ways you can do this. One is just program prioritization and you order programs by profitability index. Then you just go from the top to bottom and you fit as many items as you can. Most of simulations were uh, providing additional improvement of 10 to 15% over program prioritization. Let's say we reduce the sample size. We lose only $20 million in value if we reduce the cost by $20 million. Then our program goes here. So now we have 480 divided by 80, we had six. And this one drops out. Tim Patel has fantastic software that, that, that does this with a lot of sophistication. So here is how it works. The power curve levels off and then, then it becomes flat. And if this is your investment here, at this stage you are investing more and more money and you're not getting anything in return in terms of probability of success. You want to be here as much as possible on the steep part of the curve. Prior to phase three, you want to be here. Phase three, there are payers and regulatory requirements that are going to force you to be here, but never go here because for company, that's a waste of money. For patients, this is unethical because you're spending money here that you can invest in other programs for which there is need. At each time, you can really just assess your power curves based on the knowledge of, of your product that you have at that time. Completely independently from me, Beckman and Chen developed this concept of type three error that applies only to portfolio level. And that's the missed opportunity to invest into trials that might have identified good treatments. And you did that because probably you were overpowering some of your other trials. So let's see how that, that helps our product. We look at this separately and just compare, do we go with biomarker or not? Obviously, the answer is yes. Now we know that if we add additional 20 kilos, we get another additional 
million dollars and the total value value of portfolio improves. In conclusion, <clears throat> predictive biomarkers have potential to increase the benefit to patients and sponsors. Uh, biomarker development can add cost, complexity, and time uh, to development. Additionally, they will reduce the market size. And this is what I've heard the most as the contentious point that automatically people are just saying, no, we don't want to reduce the market size without doing a proper assessment. In this presentation, we are describing a high-level, straightforward approach that provides the optimal solution by considering all important factors. In the real program, things are going to get far more complicated, but for each program, you have to make individual decisions.